Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. This is Doc ID. One of the many questions that I always get is what do I do if I get exposed to HIV? So today we're going to talk about exposure to HIV and what is recommended here. Today's topic we're just going to go over brief general principles of HIV post exposure management. Now remember it is very important to make sure you go to your primary care doctor if this happens. So let's dive down into it. HIV infection is acquired through sexual contact, exposure to infected blood or perinatal transmission. So those are the three modes. Now, the modes of transmission of HIV varies among different countries. For example, in the US, male to male sexual contact and injection drug use account for more than 50% of cases. In contrast, places like the Sub-Saharan Africa, penile vaginal intercourse is actually responsible for 70 to 80% of HIV infections. The risk of HIV infection also varies by the type of sexual or parenteral exposure. Risk factors for HIV transmission include a high viral load in the person, presence or absence of other sexually transmitted infections, lack of circumcision and certain host and genetic factors. So first thing is first, any person with a possible exposure to HIV, they should be determined if post exposure prophylaxis with a antiretroviral therapy should be offered to reduce the risk of HIV transmission. There are several factors in making that decision. So number one, the risk of HIV acquisition. I'm going to talk about all the HIV acquisition and the risk in a different lecture. Number two, the amount of time that has elapsed after exposure. Number three, potential for drug toxicity when you're on these prophylactic medicines. And number four, the cost of medication and the need for laboratory and clinical monitoring while taking prophylaxis. So who should receive post-exposure prophylaxis? Patients who present within 72 hours of a possible HIV exposure. It is actually important to assess if the exposure presents a substantial risk of HIV acquisition. So some of these, for example, can be like condomless receptor or inserted anal or vaginal intercourse or a percutaneous exposure to blood. So it is recommended to initiate prophylaxis if the source has HIV, so the person has HIV known, then that is going to be a strong recommendation. It also depends on the HIV status of the source is unknown or if the patient was sexually assaulted. For most patients, duration of prophylaxis is 28 days. So once you go on it, you got to be on it for a month. Now, if the source is willing to get an HIV test, then we can actually stop prophylaxis if the test returns negative for both the source as well as the person exposed. So we need to we initially do a test even when you're uh, exposed, you still need to get a test to make sure you never you didn't have it from before. What is the choice of antiviral therapy? It is usually recommended to do a three drug regimen for prophylaxis. And there's several possible regimens, but in the US, we usually recommend to use what we call tenofovir and tricytobine plus a integrase inhibitor. And again, there are other alternative regimens, but that, you know, once, if you do want to get on, if, if for example, you do need to be on it, you're going to need to go and discuss it with your primary care doctor. Some other things that you really need to consider when you're choosing a regimen is if the source is HIV infected, then you are probably going to need to use a regimen that uses a integrase inhibitor or a boosted protease inhibitor as there's always a concern for a drug resistant virus if the source is HIV infected. Another thing to consider is actually people with reduced kidney function also need to have the medication adjusted properly as they go through the, the kidneys. And lastly, people who are or who could become pregnant, then it's a different particular regimen. Once again, your primary care doctor will initiate your therapy accordingly. We also need to do labs for exposure and initiating prophylaxis. The first thing is we need to determine the HIV status of the exposed person. So we do a rapid HIV test. 
and that's usually your antigen antibody assay that detects the HIV P24 antigen and HIV antibodies. We also need to know if the source has HIV or not, so that test has to be done. Other tests are hepatitis B and C, you gotta do kidney and liver function tests, you need to get a chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis tests as well. And then in this whole process, the lastly, it's patient monitoring. You're gonna need to see the patient while receiving this post-exposure prophylaxis to make sure patient seeing it and also for possible toxicity. Does the prophylaxis failure rates? Yes, they do. The patient should be informed that there are instances of prophylaxis failure and that may include not taking the medicine properly, suboptimal treatment regimen, delays in starting it, or if you have ongoing HIV exposures, you're taking a lot more risks despite being on it. So this concludes our talk for today. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. More interesting topics coming up.